All right, hey everyone. Today we're having a cardiology workshop with Infinite STEM, and we have Dr. Andreas, who's a cardiac surgeon. Um, Dr. Andreas, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody before we get started? Yeah, my name is Andreas Kemlot. I'm a cardiac surgeon. So cardiac surgery means operating on the heart, the lung, and anything within the rib cage. So that basically also means the major arteries and the eating pipe. And since even adults don't really know the difference between cardiology and cardiothoracic surgery. So cardiologists are the one who are doing all the medication and then procedure with a the catheter. These are cardiologists and then they're cardiothoracic surgeons. So today you're gonna to hear from a cardiothoracic surgeons, similar field, but a little different lifestyles, a little bit different careers and different training in order to get there. In terms of my current position, I'm in the Bay Area. I'm currently the chairman of cardiac surgery at John Muir. That's a health system here in the Bay Area. And also I'm a board member of our society here in California, California Society of Thoracic Surgery. I'm doing it now for quite some time. And uh, after fully trained heart surgeon, I'm doing it now for 16 years. And medical school and training in order to get there, unfortunately, is a very long time. That sounds interesting. So just before we get started, we want to let everybody know that we'll, me and Rishit are going to start with a few questions of our own, then we'll leave it to you guys. So feel free to ask questions in the chat. And we'll do our best to get to all of them. So for our first question, we were wondering that since cardiac surgeons are known to have long and tiring shifts, especially stressful ones, how does your day-to-day -day life look? So day-to-day -day life, unfortunately, is uh, somewhere unpredictable. And yeah, you're, you're definitely pointing out, we definitely decided to be in a field with uh, high intensity and, and uh, higher stress level. That is just coming from the nature of the beast. So we are definitely having um, patients who are needing open heart surgery. And for the most part, that's a situation which is somehow acute. So that means somebody's coming to the emergency department either with a heart attack or getting stabbed or shot in the heart. So these are pretty emergent cases. So that basically means somebody has to be available 24 seven. So we're basically covering the hospital 24 seven in order not being, having to work every single day of your life, you kind of share the call with other cardiac surgeons. So we have basically five heart surgeons covering the call, but you cannot do these operations alone. So basically two people at least have to be on call every single night. So going back to your original question. So it's definitely something where you're gonna find yourself working eight to 10 hours almost every single day. And then you're still available at night. So on weekends for emergencies, when you're on call, that is a, a pretty demanding job. So it's not the typical nine to five where you're gonna check out at five o'clock and you go home. So you have to be pretty passionate about it in order to be able to do this job, just probably like everything else where you have to go a little bit the extra mile in order A to get there and B in order to uh, be very good what you, what you can. So, so working hours are, are uh, on the higher side, but a little bit more predictable than they were 20 years ago. Um, the state of California, as well as many other states now came with working restrictions, just like an airline pilot cannot fly an airplane after he was working X amount of money, uh, X amount of uh, time. Also with surgeons now, there's a certain work limit, so you cannot work day and night and just continue the next shift. At some point you have to go home. That's obviously difficult to enforce as nobody's really fully watching you, but it certainly kind of helped us to have a little bit of a better balance. And then neither the hospital or somebody else can force you to stay longer. But, um, but it certainly is a, it's a commitment. I mean, like with any career um, where you're um, trying to be in a leader position, you definitely have an associated amount of hours, which comes with a certain amount of uh, responsibilities. Yeah, I agree. It seems like it can be pretty time consuming and it definitely requires a lot of passion to keep you going. So we were also curious, like, has the number of cases or your day to day life in general been impacted by COVID-19 in any way? Um, yeah, I mean, first, the entire world is somehow uh, impacted by COVID. And then also hospital life altogether was um, impacted just because of the fact that we suddenly got a wave of COVID patients. And then since I'm the chairman, we were sitting together with our administration as well as CDC. And then we were trying to prepare for disaster. So it's not just dealing with the patients walking through the emergency department, but we have to also prepare if things get out of hand. And the state of California and also here in the Bay Area, we had uh, three different scenarios. So best case scenario, uh, intermediate and worst case scenario. So we had to prepare ourselves for worst case scenario 
And that was in the months of uh, April, May, June last year, we basically had to shut down the hospital and only did emergency cases. So all elective operations were, were um, put on hold unless that somebody really was dying, then he did not have a surgery and the people had to wait. At the same time, also a lot of people didn't want to come to the hospital. So as you can imagine, as people were afraid to come to a hospital where patients are with COVID, there was a significant amount of patients who, even that they didn't feel well, did not want to see a doctor, didn't want to go to the hospital, not to be exposed to COVID. So a lot of people end up dying at home just because they never really saw a physician. And now after COVID kind of slowed down, we saw a, a certain kind of catch up and suddenly we had, had a wave of patients coming. And then last not least, as again, I'm dealing with every organ rib cage, I'm dealing with COVID patients themselves. So again, COVID obviously, as you guys know, is affecting the lung primarily. It's a, a pneumonia caused by a virus, which caused some form of an inflammation or destruction of the lung, just like any pneumonia does. And unfortunately, it can be very aggressive to the point where it really dis destroys or at least com um, compromise your lung function that you cannot breathe. So we have patients in the hospital who we have to put on a heart lung machine just because their lungs are not working. So these people don't have the capability or capacity to breathe on their own anymore. And the only way to get them through this was these hard lung machines where they have basically have an artificial lung. That certainly is pretty desperate, but we have patients. And once you have one of the machines, unfortunately survival is very, very small and limited. But, uh, but yeah, no, our life has significantly changed. It definitely got better over the last uh, six, eight months. Um, we are however prepared that things might gonna get worse again in the winter months. And, um, and so now we're almost back to a normal, but we certainly, are highly aware that the situation can change on a daily basis. Yeah, that's actually really interesting the way that COVID and its uh, unpredictability can actually impact many jobs, like you said. So I actually wanted to backtrack to something you said a little bit earlier about how the practice in your field has changed, um, maybe from now to a couple of decades ago. So as we know, currently there's a lot of technological advances going on with robotic surgery and maybe new ways like uh, track and monitor anything related to the heart or the lungs or anything like that. So my question is in the future, maybe within the next 10, 20 years, how do you think technology is going to further enhance uh, your practice in your field in general? Um, I think that in our case, um, every field is impacted by technology and that's the beauty about medicine. I mean, everybody who will get involved in medicine is knowing that the fantastic and interesting part by medicine is that it's highly dynamic. There's certain areas where things are pretty much kind of done the same way as they were done 10, 20, 30 years ago. Medicine is rapidly changing and the way we're doing it rapidly changes. And, uh, and I think that um, robotic is, is a, a way to do things minimum invasively. And I think that's kind of the overall theme. I mean, the, the name of the game is to do things uh, with less risk, minimal invasive, less pain, less time in the hospital, these kind of things. And over the last... 15 years, probably the biggest um, evolution in, in heart surgery and cardiology was the development of doing a lot of things with a catheter rather than with open heart surgery. So having an, a heart valve replaced or repaired was just feasible with an open chest. So that's a big operation with associated risk. And then also being in the hospital for about a week. And now for the last 12 years at John Meon for longer Internationally, we're doing these heart valve replacements just with a catheter alone, where you basically get poked in the groin. With a catheter, you can deploy a heart valve into the heart just with a balloon catheter alone without any open heart surgery, no heart lung machine, no chest, and people go home the next day. So the development is certainly very rapid. And um, uh, robotic surgery has some... some um, importance in, in cardiac surgery, but it's not that important as, as we can do a minimal invasive operations with just small instruments, which um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if the robot is driving it or we are driving it. So therefore, um, in cardiac surgery, robot is not the big answer. Other areas like urology, OBG, and whatnot, they're using robots all the time. In cardiac surgery, uh, we're doing things minimal invasively with small instruments and the incisions are exactly identical and we're usually faster than the robot is. However, robots, again, evolving and then maybe the understanding part about it is the robot does not really do the operation. So, so you don't, I mean, people not really sure what it means and may have the wrong idea. It's not like you're gonna have the robot do the operation. You basically just 
rather than using your fingers, you basically use a joystick or something else, and then the robot moves for you. And that's supposed to kind of reduce the amount of shake. If you get older and not having a good day, you might be shaking a little bit. Now you're doing the robot, it kind of calms things down. And maybe with certain cameras, you have a better visibility than with your bare eye or these kind of things. So it's kind of a tool or an aid to get places easier and maybe have a more steady hand. But uh, but reality is with small instruments, you can achieve the same thing if you if you're a good skilled surgeon. But robots get better, and I'm sure there's some application more and more in medicine to use robots. I think the big change will be is um, preventive medicine, and that's something which is a big field. I mean, right now what we're doing is pretty much we're fixing people who are sick, right? I mean, we're fixing high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery disease. We're fixing all kinds of problems. And I think the, the big push is to figure out how we can, how can we prevent it in the first place before it occurs, right? Rather than running behind the eight ball and fixing stuff, how can we be there to prevent it from happening? And that's actually a lot of uh, money and education invested in order to a, a convince people to have a little bit of a healthier lifestyle so that they basically just do not get too obese and certainly don't smoke and exercise and these kind of things, which certainly will reduce your risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, coronary artery disease, but also to the point now, and you maybe remember or maybe not, it started with the OJ Simpson trial many years ago where they talked about genetic fingerprints. So now it's also some research done where we just <clears throat> figured out genetically where certain diseases live. So we were able to identify, for example, women breast cancer on your genomes. So we can identify a woman and can predict in her particular case that she has a high risk of breast cancer because of bad genes. That's called hers 2 noi the different genes which are identified with breast cancer. And then, and then just like Angelina Jolie who had bad genes, then they go ahead and get prophylactic mastectomies so that they don't get breast cancer in the future, we can do the same thing for Alzheimer's and other different eras. For Alzheimer's, however, they can't do really anything about at this point in time. But so there's definitely also far more coming in terms of preventive medicine. And then maybe at some point in time, there's something called transfecting genes. So at some point in time, maybe you're going to be able to able kind of fix some of these genes at an early age before it even comes to the symptoms of the disease. Yeah, I can definitely see that technology and robotics have impacted many parts of the medical field and made like operations safer, faster, easier, and just less risk in general for the patients. And now let's move on to the chat. So we had one person ask a question and they said, on average, how long does it take to pay off all your medical school and university student loans to reach a financial situation? And is it worth overall? So, um, so there are two parts of the, the, the question. <laughs> And um, the, uh, the part, is it worth overall? I think the one thing I can tell you is you're probably going to, unless that you're going to have a startup company and going to retire five, five years later, you're going to spend many years in the field which you choose. And I've seen in my own life, the only way to be successful and being really good at the same time also enjoy what you're doing is to being passionate about what you're doing. If you kind of think it's a good idea or maybe that thinks I should go into medicine or that thinks I should go into uh, becoming an attorney or whatnot, but you have heart, you will never be great. You might be okay, but you'll never be great. And the reality of it is all these leading jobs, uh, the, the stress in order to get there and then the responsibilities are really high and there's no point of exposing it for it if you not really love what you're doing. And I've seen many people dropping out of medical school or even of residents who said, you know, I'm, I'm not signing up for that stuff. That's way too much stress on my shoulders. So in terms of, is it really worth it? It's totally worth it for me. All the different hours I've worked um, and all the training I went through, I, I think it was 100% worth it because I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm also trained in heart transplant. It's really rewarding to transplant hearts and patients who couldn't even walk across the room with chest pain the next day after transplant, they walked a couple of blocks without any pain. It's like a new, new birth and you can really help people. So you really make an impact and that's a good feeling to have. So it's totally worth it. And if it's something you're passionate about, go for it. And it doesn't matter if you're, you're passionate about playing the cello or becoming a painter. If that's what you're 100% passionate about it, and if you're willing to pay the price, you're gonna be successful. But willing to pay the price is a big ticket item. And then that goes to the price for, for medicine. Education over here is very expensive. And I, I was really lucky to graduate medical school in, in Germany. I was born and raised in Germany. So medical school in Germany is for free. And uh, so therefore college is for free too. So that was an easy, easy way for me. 
you just have to have excellent grades in order to get there. However, reality is, as you guys probably know um, better than I do, going to school in the United States, and by the time you graduate medical school, you're probably going to end up with two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars of loans, and that's a significant chunk of money. Um, after medical school, you're going to go uh, to become a heart surgeon. You go into general surgery first for some time, and then you're going to go into heart surgery, and then usually the the starting salary for, for a heart surgeon in this country is probably around $350,000. So you're gonna make the math and that's basically, you know, goes up from there over the years. But if you have $350,000 of loans to pay and you make $350,000 a year, but you also have to pay for your expense or whatnot, I mean, it's definitely gonna be investment for at least 10 years in order to kind of pay things back at a certain pace. But uh, finances, I mean, it's easy to say when you didn't have any loans coming into the field of medicine, but still until today, if it's something you're really passionate about and that kind of makes you happy, I think it's totally worth it. Yeah, so obviously for everyone else who's on the call, who's on the fence on, if they want to do a medical field profession, it's all about passion, as Dr. Andreas has said right now. And while we're on this topic of passion, someone in the chat actually had a pretty similar question. Um, Obviously, you seem very passionate about your job, but this individual is asking, how did you decide on cardio surgery as your specialty? Was there like maybe a certain instance in your life that you decided uh, that this is something you wanted to do, or maybe you had early exposure to it? Uh, could you share that with us? Right. And again, in my case, was I was very fortunate that I had interest in medicine early on as a child, and I was kind of a guy who liked to work with his hands, and I have no patience. So that kind of putting it all together kind of made the decision. So, so I'm not the kind of a guy um, who becomes a dermatologist and give you some cream and come back in three months and let me know if it works. So, so that's, you know, that's not for me. So therefore, I want to get immediate results and I want to work with my hands. So it became pretty clear early on that surgery is for me. And then at age 15, I did a one week kind of uh, rotation at uh, the local hospital to kind of shadow them for a week to get a better idea of how life is in the hospital. And I felt it was fascinating. Going to the operating room was, was definitely very impressive and I kind of liked it. So then it came down to me, it's like, hmm, what kind of surgery do you like? And then I saw, or thought about orthopedic surgery and big hammers, big prosthesis, big tools. It's just too rough for my taste. So I really kind of like to be challenged. And there's nothing wrong about orthopedic surgery. I mean, that's a great lifestyle. I mean, it could potentially be you know, the, the personal orthopedic surgeon for the Lakers or the Warriors or somebody else. And that's certainly a cool job to have or being around athletes for the time of your life. But I just want to have something a little bit more filigree, something more specific, something more challenging. So for me, the two choice was either neurosurgery or cardiac. So I felt that the, the uh, highest challenge was in these two fields. And again, I mean, we're doing bypasses. When we do bypasses, the suture we, we're using to suture the bypass on the heart a little bit thinner than the hair. So we're wearing loops in order to make it happen. And if you, you know, put one bad stitch in there, then the bypass is not going to last very long. So it's, it's definitely a certain challenge. So I enjoyed the challenge. And the reason why I didn't end up being the heart versus the, the brain was that at this time and still until today, um, even if you're doing a fantastic job in neurosurgery, uh, most of the patients still have disabilities or are paralyzed after because if you take a big tumor out of somebody's brain, even after a good operation, there's still a significant amount of um, disabilities. And then if somebody has a tumor, unfortunately, most of them are dead in three, three years anyway or faster. So heart surgery was more rewarding. So heart surgery is something the outcomes are fantastic. On an average open heart surgery, probability of dying is about one to two percent. So that's pretty awesome. And, um, and again, the overall patient's feeling excellent. So it's very rewarding for, for the surgeon as well as also for the patient and the family. Yeah, cardiology seems like a very challenging field. And someone in the, question, someone in the chat actually had a question about the specific, specifics of it. So what exactly is the difference between cardiology and cardiac, cardiac surgery? And which would you say is harder or more challenging? So, I mean, and that's the... So Cardiologist is internal medicine. So these are medicine doctors, is cardiology. A surgeon is a cardiac surgeon. So the big difference is if you're not feeling so good or whatnot, or your regular doctor feels well, you're getting older, you have some symptoms, he will send you to a cardiologist. So the cardiologist will treat you with medication and he will take care of you. And then he feels, well, you may be at risk having some heart condition, then he's doing some tests. That means he's doing ultrasounds and he's doing these, these catheter procedures, these angiograms. And if, uh, and if there's some 
limited problems. If you have blockage to one of the artists, they can also do a stent. So it's basically anything which doesn't include surgery. So that means diagnostic and, um, and medical management and some form of treatment uh, in terms of intervention. But the moment when things really fall apart, so that means now he really has a very bad valve or he has really bad arteries and it now needs something in an open chest where it needs something more invasive all the way to artificial hearts and transplants or whatnot, then the cardiologist basically hands them over to us. So we are the people who are gonna fix it once things get much worse. If you have a little bit of heart disease, usually it can be treated with medication or maybe sometimes with a stent as you probably heard before. But if that's not enough, then we get into the ballpark. In terms of cardiologists, I think have a great lifestyle and that's a great, great um, option for, for a career. I mean, a cardiologist these days do a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, residency fellowship is shorter than becoming a cardiac surgeon. You can have a pretty good quality of life if you decide to do so. And you can, at the same time, as a cardiologist, you can move any place in the United States or probably in the world and just open a practice and just see patients. Cardiac surgeon can't do this because you have to have a big hospital where they do open heart surgery. So there's only so many places where you can go and become a cardiac surgeon. You cannot open a private practice or your own practice because you cannot do open heart surgery in the office. A cardiologist can do things in this office. So, so having said, compare and side by side, I think cardiologist is a very smart option and a good career choice. And as again, they're doing these catheter, these stents, and now they're working together with us on these heart valves, which are deployed with catheters. So they're getting more and more involved with invasive procedures. So their job is, I think, very interesting and gets more invasive. At the same time, um, surgeons are probably getting, when cardiologists basically quit and they say, well, they're too sick to, to checking out CPR, nothing is working, then we move in. So the acuity level is certainly higher what we're seeing as a cardiac surgeon. Yeah, and in fact, while we're on the topic of invasive or invasive surgery, or as you were saying, open heart surgery, obviously, like a lot of people on this call, um, probably have second thoughts about being a surgeon just because of the potential risk or like the like overall stress of performing these surgeries is. So someone in the question asked, were you ever nervous during a heart surgery, maybe like in your early years um, as a practitioner? And if so, how did you deal with it? Or how did you learn to cope with it? Well, I think that's... Um... I'm not sure if nervous is the correct answer or fear, but, but there's definitely a situation when things get pretty tense, right? And just to give you a very easy example, I mean, if somebody comes and he got shot in the chest three times and is, he's basically exsanguinating, he's bleeding out in front of you and he opens his chest, this is a pretty serious situation, right? Are you fearful? Are you nervous? I wouldn't call it this one, but you're certainly pretty tense and you're definitely working with all your 100% of your capacity uh, capability capacity in order to kind of turn things around and then since we don't have hearts or parts on the shelves not like going to go in there and kind of going to replace stuff if things are kind of get destroyed somebody had a heart attack or got sh shot or stabbed or whatnot we have to fix stuff by just trying to figure out ourselves how we can put things back together so so the current situation where you're where you're racing you got the against the clock i mean i've been there sweating because i you know, operating along a very fine line be between life and death for eight or 10 hours, and you're still not sure if you're going to get him back or not. So it's a pretty tense moment at this time. And, and unfortunately, it can go both ways. I mean, most of the time we're lucky we get them back. The human body is very resilient, but there are also times when they just were past that point, eventually into dying on the table in the hospital. So, so really nervous, I don't really think so. Once you're, I mean, not fearful, nervous but certainly aware and you certainly have a certain um respect for what you're doing i mean you know you go in there and i personally i say a prayer before i go and at the same time i'm you know bring my a game i want to make sure i'm fully fully there i'm not distracted by something else um as you become if you're a medical student and in residence and they're requesting or asking you to do certain things then yeah i mean you prepare yourself as good as you can the night before any kind of operation you're participating you maybe want to read about it and want to be as good prepared and as you do everything for the first time i mean yeah it's a certain stress involved um but uh but not to the poor point that you should be fearful and that's i think just also for safety reasons if you're fearful then you maybe should get some support or somebody more senior or somebody else should be helping you so that's that's you know the fear should be converted to 
intense but not fearful but no but it's as you can imagine i mean the the nature of the beast i mean we have people who just at pete's coffee suddenly have a full cardiac arrest they're coming in cpr and an ambulance we're rushing to the operating room and operate on them i mean it's a it's a stressful situation just like somebody got shot yeah i agree and on top of the job being tense itself the entire path to get there can be pretty tense as well especially with all the tests you have to take in the top-notch grades and i'm pretty sure competitions are at all-time highs right now so are there any extracurriculars or class activities that you would suggest students in high school to take to better our chances of getting into cardiac surgery or the medical field in general? Interesting about it is that in terms of the career opportunities, interesting enough, cardiac surgery becomes less competitive as less and less people want to do it, which is pretty, pretty interesting. So um, when I um, started training for cardiac surgery with my fellowship, it's about 20 years ago, there was a large amount of applicants who uh, wanted to go in the field of cardiac surgery that significantly reduced itself over the years as, as reimbursement with Medicare and whatnot kind of declined. And again, as you point out, people say, well, we have other options. We don't want to go through all the years of, of training to become a cardiac surgeon. So to give you some idea, I mean, after medical school, originally when, when, when I was uh, doing my training, you had to do about six years of general surgery and then another three years of cardiac surgery. So after medical school was another nine years of training. In the meantime, now they figured it out. That's a really long time before you really are fully trained. So now they have combined program where you do three years of general surgery and three years of cardiac surgery, but it's still six years after medical school before you're fully board certified and before you can work on your own. But interesting enough about it is, is uh, less and less people want to go on cardiac surgery for all the reasons you just pointed out. But I can tell you, I think that at this point in your, in your life, you, it would be very hard at age 15, 17, 19 to decide, hey, listen, I'm going to go on cardiac surgery. That's the one. I think at this point in time, if you feel that medicine is something which has something to offer for you and you would be interested and passionate about it, then just look into it and A, give an opportunity to maybe shadow somebody for a few days or a week, you cannot get a better idea. Or if you feel that medicine is the place for you, that's just like saying, hey, I'm gonna to fly to Europe. Europe could be any place. There could be Norway, cold and freezing, or it could be, um, could be Italy, or it could be Germany or in between. So when you say, I'm gonna go into medicine, if you study medicine, you have a pretty broad range of opportunities. I mean, you can have a rather quote unquote, cush job of becoming an eye doctor or a dermatologist or a, you know, different, different fields, a regular GP, a general practitioner. Internal medicine was a very reasonable lifestyle. You have your typical nine to five hours, you go home, you don't take calls, you don't have to work in the hospital, uh, all the way to, the, to what I'm doing and what neurosurgeons are doing. So there's a pretty broad range of what you can do. So there's definitely something for everybody. And again, I know patients, I'm sorry, I know, know friends who are orthopedic surgeons, like I said earlier, they have a great practice to take care of athletes, they're having a great time, they go into ball games. Have, pay, have people who are cardiologists, um, you know, they're doing most, most of the work in their, in their office. They can literally move anywhere they want. They're in high demand, which is great. And uh, everything in between, they can become a radiologist. They can move to Australia and do everything remote from your computer. You don't have to live here. So, I mean, there are definitely a lot of opportunities in medicine. Um, so it doesn't mean you have to go all the way. Even if you say, well, that sounds kind of cool. I would be very surprised if you have a firm impression, but really get your feet wet. I mean, get involved. Be like a sponge, absorb what impressions are out there and then decide for yourself what's interesting. I would not be surprised that somebody says, hey, this cardiac surgery sounds great. And then the next thing he finds himself doing a rotation, whatever, at OB and says, oh my gosh, that is really super cool. And I maybe can even go to a third world country, which I always want to do, whatever it was. For some time, I did liver transplants and that was definitely something I enjoyed as well. And I could have easily turned out to be a liver transplant surgeon. The only thing was that the liver transplant surgeon I worked with they're very arrogant and, and, and they're very abusive. So they kind of, uh, you know, give me a little bit better taste and that kind of gravitate more to heart transplants. But, uh, but yeah, again, I don't think, I think if you get, a, get in a big category, if you can somehow at this point in your life figure out, hey, I'm just very interested about working with people and interested in medicine, that's the important step. The other step part you can figure out. And if you say, hey, listen, I'm the guy who is an IT person. I'm the guy who is a law person. I'm the guy who is an engineer, whatever. So if you're going to get the big buckets, then the details are pretty easy down the road. 
All right, so I think everyone got a pretty good taste on how to decide, um, you know, first of all, what career path you should take, but also how to pursue whatever career path you want to take. Obviously, being a doctor involves a lot of uh, communication, involves you testing it out a lot of new things to see which uh, specific field you're interested in. And we're really glad that you're able to share that with us, Dr. Andres. So I think we're running a little bit out of time right now. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up with one last question. Is there any like final thoughts, final words, final advice you'd like to give to anyone on the call who's, who just be like interested in learning a little bit more? Yeah, I think that's the key part about as you may know statistics in the United States, 70% of, of people are doing a job they don't enjoy, or at least they're not passionate about. That's pretty pathetic, right? And you don't want to be the one. And I can tell you, uh, Jim Carrey actually gave a gave a lecture at a commencement speech uh, at a graduation. He basically says, hey, ask the universe. And he says, look at me, you know, what I can achieve. And I, I certainly don't have the, uh, the uh, prominence of or the, uh, the caliber of Jim Carrey, but I, can, I came from a small place in Germany and I decided to become a heart surgeon and end up being the chairman over here. And that's pretty much against all odds. So what I'm trying to say is um, don't be discouraged for exams and don't be discouraged by any kind of competition. Right now, cardiac surgery, there's not too much competition, but it doesn't matter, whatever you pick, do what you're passionate about it, and then the success will follow, and with the success, also money will follow. So don't try to make a decision because that's a very lucrative field where there's a lot of money over there. People become plastic surgeons or IT or in order to make a lot of money, but they hate doing it. So, so the key video is you can literally achieve anything, and I know what I'm talking about, but yet we have to be willing to pay the price. Don't be discouraged. And then Ala Trasnaya says there's no plan B. Don't and I was a plan B. You say, that's what I want to do. So don't tell me, oh, if I can I do this one, I'm going to do something else. That's fine. But at some point in your life, you really have to put your eggs in the basket and say, hey, listen, I want to be the best I can in this one field and just go for it. And you can achieve it. There's nothing which is going to stop you. Yeah, definitely. And it's certainly not being highly intelligent. There's definitely a cardiac surgeon more intelligent than I am. I just had to study hard in order to pass the, the exam. So nobody can stop you if you're passionate about it. And it's a long time, many years to live in a field if you're not passionate about it. And you can still fail in a field where you're not passionate about it. So you might as well pick something you're really passionate about. And I promise you, nothing can stop you if you're willing to pay the price for it and if you're passionate about it. Yeah, so the key takeaway is definitely passion and enjoying what you do. So that pretty much wraps up our event. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. And especially thank you to Dr. Andreas for having us here and telling us a lot about cardiology and being a cardiac surgeon. Before you go, make sure to check out our Instagram and our YouTube. We're going to be posting all the stuff that you should know for future events on there and check out our website. But other than that, thank you so much for coming and we hope to see you guys in future events soon. It's a pleasure. All the best for you and you guys for your career. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Andreas. Thank you.